Hello. In this short lesson we'll be looking at factorial analyses of variance. You'll remember that some time ago we looked at one-way analyses of variance where we have a continuous response and different levels of a single categorical predictor. We also went on to look at two-way analyses of variance where we had two categorical predictors and a continuous response. And I mentioned briefly that we can build simple models with the different levels of one predictor and the different levels of another predictor. But then we can also add an interaction term for the complex way in which the individual categorical predictors might interact to influence that response. Let's have a look at this interaction term uh, here uh, within the general linear model framework. What it says is that for this particular combination of fertilizer and pesticide we should have a certain adjustment delta and for this combination 1 and 2 we should have another adjustment delta 2 and so on and so forth. The null hypothesis in these cases is that all of these adjustments are the same, i.e. that there is no real interaction uh, going on uh, uh, in terms of the effect of these predictors on that response. Let's have a look graphically what we mean by an interaction. So let's say uh, we've done an experiment in which we have varied the levels of the fertilizer. We have A, B and C and we have a response yield. And let's say that uh, these points uh, more or less uh, represent what the population means are. So they're pretty reliable. So here we can see that fertilizer B uh, produces the higher yield when at least we have pesticide 1 applied. But when we have an interaction, the effect of this fertilizer on yield depends on the level of this other categorical variable, in this case pesticide. So it might be, for example, that when we have pesticide 2, here B is no longer the highest yielding fertilizer, and in fact it's A. So Interactions occur when the effect of one predictor variable on that response is influenced by the levels of another predictor variable in the model. So it's something more sophisticated and conditional. I now want to look at the factorial analysis of variance design. And we'll do so by looking at a simple experiment where we have sowing rate and variety. Let's say we've got four types of sowing rate of a, a seed and two types of a variety uh, of our wheat. Now, if we were interested in sowing rate and variety, there are a number of different designs we could think uh, to develop. But here is one that would be particularly informative. So we've got four sowing rate combinations we're interested in and two varieties. Of course, and here the numbers, I should say, are uh, the replicates uh, of each of these different combinations of our predictor variables. Of course, if we were interested in variety, we might spend uh, a lot of effort looking at just this sowing rate here, or just this one here. Uh, or if we were interested in sowing rate, we might want to look at just one variety rather than both varieties. But in this case, we can actually look at both the effect of variety on our yield and also the sowing rate on the yield and actually look at the interaction because it may well be that the uh, effect of variety is important in that V1 gives a higher yield, for example, but only at these sowing rates and not at those sowing rates. So this type of design allows us to investigate interactions i.e. when the effect of one predictor variable on the response depends on the level of the other. We've got things covered because with this simple design uh, we've got all of the combinations nicely uh, evenly matched. 
It also means that any given observation can be used in not just one comparison, for example, uh, between varieties, but also across the way here uh, between sowing rates. So with this design, we have what's called hidden replication in that our observations are being used in several ways uh, when conducting our analyses. This is of course a, a factorial design and in fact it's two factors here we've got variety and sowing rate and it's a four times two level so we've got four levels of sowing rate and two uh, levels of the variety. Now let's have a look at applying a factorial analysis uh, by using R. And here are the data that we're going to be looking at. Uh, this is from Sokol and Rolf, uh, a really nice biometry text. And it's actually looking at the consumption of male and female rats of different types of lard, whether it's fresh lard or rancid lard. And what we can see here is that we've got a factorial design and that we're interested in looking at the sex of the rat, but we're also interested in looking at uh, the state of lard. And uh, we can examine sex and lard and their interaction if we apply the appropriate model. So let's first uh, enter our data uh, such that we can use it in R. And because it's a simple uh, list of data, then I'm simply going to write it out. We've got our consumption data here for 709 all the way down to 539. We've got our sex. We've got three males here. We've got three females here, three males and three females and so on. And then uh, we've got the state. I've called it tasty, uh, where, whether all of these are fresh or uh, rancid. So we've created three vectors, one for consumption, one for sex, and that varies male, 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 and then female, 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 and so on, and uh, one for the state, which I've called tasty, uh, which is uh, six freshes and six rancids. And that collectively represents this entire data set. Now, how do we fit a factorial analysis of variance? Well, with a factorial analysis of variance, we're looking not just at the main effects, but also their interactions. And so here, we're fitting a linear model with consumption and sex times tasty. You'll remember that the times represents a uh, fit of an, a model with interactions, and it knows uh, straight away that sex and tasty are both categorical variables that have been defined in that way, and uh, we can plot out our results. So what do these results indicate? Well, I find it particularly useful to start at the bottom and move from interactions to main effects. Because if your interaction is significant, then it's clear that those predictor variables play some role in affecting that response, whether or not those predictor variables are significant as main effects. But in this case, uh, there is no significant interaction in that our p-value is relatively high. We would get that outcome or a more extreme uh, in a high proportion of cases, even if the null hypothesis of there being no interaction were true. But we can say that there's a significant effect of large state in that our tasty predictor is highly significant and there is no significant effect of sex on the consumption of the uh, the lard. Now, have a look at this design with regard to the amount of replication. We had three replicates for each of these combinations. Is that just a pretty thing or does it actually matter to the analysis? Well, it really does help uh, interpretation in the analysis if this experiment is what we call orthogonal or balanced. And by that I mean that we've got equal replication for each of the treatment combinations. Let's revisit this issue of orthogonality. Two categorical variables are orthogonal, i.e. they're not associated with one another and they're not collinear if knowledge of one provides no information about the other. So for example, if we knew the sex, we wouldn't be able to uh, guess what state of lard that sex individual was actually presented with. 
in a factorial general linear model uh, the two factors are orthogonal if the same number of observations are made for all uh, of the level combinations. Why is that important? Well, in those orthogonal designs, the type 1, type 2 and type 3, and we've, we've met two of those, the first and the uh, last sums of squares, uh, are all equal. And so interpretation is easy. And that is because our predictive variables are not collinear with one another. They're not changing as we change the other. And uh, it makes our interpretation that much easier and that we don't need to think about an alternative uh, interpretation based on an alternative partitioning of the sums of squares. We like easy. And so it's important where possible to strive for equal replication in these factorial designs. So we know in this case that we have a balanced design. We've got three replicates for each of the combinations of sex and state of lard. Uh, but how would we fit a type 3 sum of squares model to data uh, if our design wasn't completely orthogonal and we really wanted to, even though it's a bit of a silly thing to do uh, when we've got interactions. But whatever, we'll still do it because that's the default. How do we want to do that? Well, uh, here's how we uh, could do it. Uh, we could load the library car, which has a, a type 3 sum of squares option. But uh, here's the important thing. When fitting models uh, using this particular option within car, we need to reset the contrasts. The typical contrasts are treatment contrasts, but here we need to set them to some contrasts for rather technical reasons. And later on, we might get into uh, contrasts. Uh, here is the fit of the model again, um, but this time we're actually going to look at it in terms of uh, running a type 3 sum of squares using the ANOVA function with uh, capital A. And you'll see that we get uh, precisely the same results uh, for our particular data because uh, our design was perfectly balanced.